Chapter 64 Love and Longing I have to admit, a pook cooking keeps catching me off guard with how savory it is. Vernon remarks as he uses a dining skewer to spear a few pieces of the salad he had bought. As carnivores, the entire species has a different concept of most foods. Sure, they can eat vegetables, but it's mostly as a tiny side bit to the actual meal, usually for flavor or a palate cleanser. Garnishes are also popular, as were cheeses. What was a mixture of beef cubes wrapped in bacon and fried until the bacon was crispy, but there was a heart of pink with a primal taste with slow-cooked chicken that was then pulled apart strand by strand. A hint of spice as the apuk actually are able to stomach it, which was labeled as a challenger in the menu and he had a wonderful meal. The pastries were basically honey crullers on one side and bacon buns on the other. He apparently blended right in saving the sweetest bits for last, then getting a carry bag of more bacon buns for later. The meat melange sat very well in his stomach and washed down with lightly lime-tasting water. The crullers had given him the opportunity to cuddle with Miro Noir a little more and licking off her fingers, a favor she was eager to return. Unfortunately, they didn't have as much time to cuddle and kiss as the lineup was still large. A glance to his communicator and he still got a great deal of time before the next match, at least three hours at this rate. After showing it to Miro Noir, she decides to show him around a few historical sites along the city a public park surrounding an old battle arena where the ground is hardened and tempered stone. Apparently, it was melted and remade time and again by warfire and used to settle disputes among princesses who could not talk it out. She then shows him a few preserved buildings, halls where ancient war banners were woven and designed, a preserved forge where the traditional methods of shell and weapon crafting were taught to this day. He pays careful attention to the fact that Apuk do in fact use weapons, large ones so they can leverage a brutal cutting edge or smashing force with their axiom-empowered strength. He takes careful note of the design and pattern, something Miro Noir notices. He assures her that he's just finding out a few ways to surprise people for later. She raises an eyebrow at the idea but doesn't press him. Finally, time comes to head back to the arena and they both snack on the little bacon buns as they go, more than occasionally feeding each other the little treats. His number comes up and once again he's in the first fight of the round. He assures her that he's got everything planned out and will even have time for a little bit of entertainment as he wins. He's called out to the arena, contestant number one of fight number one. The other five are all larger apuk with muscles on their muscles. He roughly comes up to their stomachs by comparison. No doubt someone on the Dauntless is getting their fetish fuel from this. They're all also glowing as they channel Axiom defensively to try and get around exotic techniques, which means they're taking him very seriously. And here they are, ladies. Our first contenders of round two, Goyetis announces with glee as he hits the light in the arena and heads over to his marked starting position. Each of these warriors have already proven themselves strong and cunning, but the first two rounds is always, always about separating the frail from the formidable. Can they keep it up? She announces. Once again, our most unusual contestant is the alien sorcerer who revealed himself last round, but it looks like he'll have a harder time as the girls are ready for him. I'm directing the microphone right to his starting position if he has anything to say. Goyaitis announces, and he looks up towards where the camera is before smiling. I do have something to say, directed at my friends back on the Dauntless. I'll do your silly reference, and I will win the round, but no more games after this. I have to take things seriously in the more advanced rounds. Someone's confident. What kind of reference are you making? Goyaitis asks him. It's related to the time abilities. They helped me develop them, but... I had to promise to make the joke. There's a Time Master villain in a popular entertainment series with a certain war cry. This is not a game, someone screams from the audience. 
And with that, I dare to say that we've burned too much time, though it looks like time control won't work twice with the protections those girls have up. Now we begin the round in five, four, three, two, one, begin. Zawarudo! Vernon bellows out, throwing his arms to the side in a massively exaggerated pose, and everything goes mute. He tries to talk, but the moment the sound leaves his mouth, it goes still as well. He pushes against the thick, nearly solid air and walks up to the nearest contestant. He has to climb up her somewhat and then rain a series of punches onto her shell. Luckily, the little touches of kutha he's wearing are letting him keep himself strong and durable, as it takes all his concentration to keep himself accelerated to this degree. Shell safely shattered, he walks up to the next one and hops up using the tip of her swinging tail as a step. He finds a seam in the forging of the shell and causes the entire lump of armor to buckle and break. Just to be sure, he digs his fingers in and pries it apart. Hop down, jog to the next one. She's taken a low primal stance that lets him grab onto the overlarge spikes in her shell and climb up somewhat. He then slams his heels into the gaps and the whole thing is reduced to a chunk of twisted metal. The next shell is interestingly made and also low to the ground as in the time it took him to say Zawarudo. The Apuk had time to start sprinting at him low and fast. He's going to have to dodge her when this is over. He examines the very smartly designed segmented plates. Each one could easily be replaced from the whole and likely more than half of them will need to be broken to count as a properly shattered shell. He rips out the segments and crumbles them one after another. She used a slightly springy alloy that isn't as hard as other metals but is far from brittle. Just to be sure, he tears out all of them, then steps over her with a touch of regret. If not for him, participating this girl might have gone to the finish. She's very quick and clearly diligent in her work better luck next time. The last one is the hardest to get to. She's partway through a jump to get herself out of reach. Clearly this is another good contender for going all the way as he has to power, jump himself just to reach her. He climbs up her leg and onto the shell he pries off her back before jumping down. He then squeezes hard and the whole thing shatters. It was very brittle. So he was wrong. She would not have survived this round one way or the other. Head starting to pound with the strain of maintaining not only his absurd acceleration, but sustaining him, buoying him up and phasing him slightly out of reality so he doesn't accidentally cause a concussive shockwave at these speeds is really starting to add up, and he nurses his throbbing skull and walks back to his starting position, turns around and crosses his arms with a smirk. Appearances are important after all. He lets the power go and then immediately leaps clean over the dam near flying a pook that blurs through his space, his arms still crossed and the smirk still affixed. It's over! He's won again! Goyita screams in excitement before the crowd drowns her out. I know, right? That was absurd! The moment he finished the battle cry, he won! How did he do that? Maybe one of your cameras caught it? He calls up and it's caught on the directional microphone as his opponents all regard their shattered and broken armor in dismay. Going up against a time bender has to be seriously discouraging. They did. You were everywhere. Goddess and shells. How did you do that? Goyetus demands, as Vernon looks up to see his image being replaced by a blurry still that shows him destroying every single shell at once and racing to each contestant as if he was part of a hundred-man army. Round one, I took away everyone's time. Round two, I gave it all to myself. Simple as that. Now, if you'll excuse me, he says before walking out of the arena as the crowd roars in excitement. So, you had your fun? Miro Noir asks him, and he shrugs. I kept my promise. I kind of get the joke, but not really. I won't be using time manipulation for the rest of the tournament unless something goes wrong. Next round, I'll test out how much I can enhance myself physically and see if I can use my transmutations in combat. He says, and she giggles. What? 
the biggest tournament for the Apuk and you're testing your limits and pushing yourself in ways that few consider. I heard that I wasn't allowed to bring weapons and I trained in hand to hand. You heard you're not allowed to bring weapons and you think about how to make them on the spot. Two different viewpoints to bring about the best. Vernon begins to answer before a hand grabs his shoulder. You cheated. The green dress wearing Apuk accuses him. How do you figure that? Vernon asks as Mironoir begins to look utterly furious. Never before has time manipulation been a part of this tournament. You render your foes helpless before they can do anything. That's not just cheating. That's cowardly. Do you bring knives to arguments, cannons to fist fights, war fleets to legal duels? She all but screams at him before taking a breath and backing away, letting him go and glaring at him. You need to calm down. If what I've done is against any rules, then you're the only one who's bothered to tell me that, Vernon says, even as he puts an arm between Mironoir and her to stop his wife from pouncing. Let it go, my love. I dare say I'll be facing her in the next round. We wouldn't want her to try and argue a disqualification, would we? That's your kind of cowardly tactic, not mine, she states primly before marching off. If not for the tournament, I'd have showed that self-important twit exactly what it means to anger a princess or insult her husband, Mironoir says with small green sparks flying from her mouth. She's well and truly upset. You can always challenge her to a duel after the fact, or even sooner, I've got ideas for next round, he says, and she huffs, before visibly shifting gears and smiling at him. Oh? Well, I couldn't help but notice the design of those Duchess Wars words, so if I can reshape some of the arena into one of those, then suddenly I've got a heavy advantage. Couple that with the fact that a sword grabs a lot of attention and I'll be able to use it as a distraction while I go for their shells. But what will you make it from? Do you not need a sample of some... Oh, that would work, wouldn't it? Mironoir asks before stopping herself as she gazes on his armor. It would. It most certainly would, he remarks with a grin. Also, it would work in another way. There are no known forms of axiom use that doesn't have at least two interesting uses.